I'd like to preach you a message entitled, Jesus Christ, the Better Minister. Jesus Christ, the Better Minister. Let's begin, please, with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning, having feel, felt like I have not prayed enough, am not adequate to give the sermon. Lord, I know that this is much, it needs to be much more than theatrical. Father, it needs to be powerful. There are people probably in our congregation who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And no amount of silvery tongues can bring them to salvation, Lord. You have to. And Father, it would be a terrible shame if somebody left this place having heard the gospel, heard the good news of how to be forgiven of all their sin, their life sin, because of what Jesus did on that cross and turn it away and not understand or get lost in some kind of speech and shut their heart off to you. And I pray, O oh God, that you would bring old time power, the kind that fell at Pentecost when 3,000 called on you as their Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord, that you would work on every heart, that every heart would be open. I pray that distractions would be gone. I pray that you would quiet cell phones, you'd quiet things and distractions that could take our thoughts away. And dear Lord, I pray that we would just have a time where we heard from the Lord. In Jesus' precious name, I ask humbly, amen. You can go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 8 if you want to. I, I want to share with you something personal about the Lord. I'm always very interested in his, his if you can call them, no, dis, no, uh, no blasphemy intended or anything like that, but no, his idiosyncrasies, what God likes and what he doesn't like. It's very interesting to me. I mean, he is God. I want to share with you something about his character and his personality. I've told it to you before, and, and in the book of Hebrews, it just sticks out so much. The Lord, he loves symbols. Symbols that mean certain things. Now, I don't mean, you know, these, these funny movies that have come out in the last... Uh, encryption kind of movies that have come out in the last several years. I'm talking about object lessons and landmarks and analogies and allegories and foreshadowing, things that God has, has given on the earth and written in the Bible and done in very physical ways in order to teach us more about Him. Very often it is about uh, the explanation of who Jesus is, and often it is about the explanation of something God likes or doesn't like. God is the master of taking something spiritual and making an earthly comparison that explains it, and He's the master of taking something earthly and showing you that it has heavenly meaning. He's the God that says things like this, Go to the ant, thou slugger, consider your ways and be wise. What? I step on ants. I don't go to them. I spray them with raid. Okay? God says, uh, you know, the ants, you can learn something from them. You know, he, does, he doesn't have any guide or overseer yet, you know, in the, in the warmer months, gets food, takes it down. You know, you, can learn, you lazy bum, you can learn something from the ant. That's basically what the Bible says in Proverbs in a chapter. You know, God is the master of taking things. I mean, all this world is organized for his explanation. He is the master of creating something in the past and to use as an explanation of something in the present or something in the future. As we continue to preach through Hebrews today, we see in this book exposed truth that, that is foreshadowing. We see exposed truth that the, the priesthood and the tabernacle and all those Jewish things, the sacrifices, and even the, at the end of the chapter, even the law itself, the Ten Commandments and all the other rules that went along with that, even those things were shadows. They were not, they were not the real things. They were shadows of a clear day. They were not the end truth in themselves, but rather a schematic of something that was coming. They were a Polaroid shot of a real thing. They were a shadow, the Bible says in Hebrews 8, of, of heavenly things. God designed them to be earthly representations of heavenly realities. We need to understand that. Some people say, you know, they have the idea that, you know, heaven is kind of like this misty place, and you're, you know, handed your harp, and you're like on your cloud, and you're just kind of like in slow motion. Strum. Listen, this is the misty place. Heaven is the clear place, okay? We are walking around, uh, like the Bible says, in a glass darkly, looking in a mirror, the old time mirrors that were, sh were, were shiny metal, and they, you know, people are like, look, you know, am I beautiful? Or what, is that an indentation on the metal, you know? Uh, you, know you know, we are living that way. 
Heaven is the clear place. We also use shadows in our day. Things that mean different things. You, you think about, I have, a, I have a wedding band here, okay? And uh, when Amy and I were getting married, I gave her an engagement ring and got it out of Rice Krispies and uh, gave her the engagement ring and then gave her the, uh, the wedding band that went with the engagement ring. Listen, those kind of things, they are, they don't, you know, that is not marriage. And that is not forever love, that's symbol, you know, the circular, the made out of gold, you know, it's pure and all that. That's all symbolic. We use these kind of things, and God uses these kind of things to explain much greater truth to us. And with this understanding, look at Hebrews chapter 8. I'll let, let you be seated since we're reading the entire book. Or, the, yeah, entire book. We're going to read the entire book today. No, the entire chapter one more time because I want you to get it. We want to preach the Word of God here. So you've got to understand the verses themselves. Don't listen to me. Look at the Bible. It says, Now the things... Which we have spoken, this is the sum. Okay, this is the summation of the last couple of chapters. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. You'll notice that that word majesty is a, is a, uh, it is a word that the first letter is a big letter, which um, that means capitalized. I lost the word there for a minute. But it is a proper noun idea. It's talking about God, Jehovah. All right? A minister of the sanctuary. And of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man, that is, Jesus is the minister. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of, of necessity that this man, Jesus, have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on the earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that's God, that thou make all these things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he, Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry, by how, how much also uh, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better, upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come. Them is, look up here a moment, them refers to the promises of the new covenant under Moses and, you know, the covenant itself. There, it was broken. It wasn't right. Okay, something was wrong with it. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I, I, I regarded them not, I disregarded them, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. And write, will, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know ye the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that he saith, A new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away, talking about that new, or that old covenant. As we turn to Hebrews chapter 8 with this understanding of symbols and what God does to explain more heavenly things, don't get lost in the symbols. Don't get lost in the religion. For instance, the offertory, the offering, is not true religion. It is a demonstration of it. Sometimes people get very upset when you take traditions out. I'm sure eventually... We are working on something. I didn't mean to say this, okay? But I, we're working on uh, being able to make contributions through the website. And they have, a, uh, 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 they have a technology on the website that you could actually tithe through your bank account, okay? God forbid! Don't take away tradition! We got to pass that wooden plate, okay? Now listen, it's not the tradition of things. I believe that we should ha respect some great tradition, but it's not the tradition of the things that's worshiped to God. It's a matter of those things that come truly, truly from the heart. Our worship is real. It is not with clothing and with uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, it is not with routines. It is certainly not through this schedule of got to do this, got to do this, Pastor Prick gets up, you get up, da, 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 da. And sometimes people are content with that kind of religion and realize that it is not the real thing. 
it is a way to do the real thing. It is a tool to do the real thing. As we look at Hebrews chapter 8, we see that Jesus Christ is the real thing. All those things that were done in the Jewish tradition and the Jewish uh, uh, worshiping of bringing sacrifices and all that, they were just shadows of something that was real to come. Jesus is the real object. Verse 1 shows that the Lord is wrapping up the arguments of, the several, uh, of several chapters. If you'll notice verse number 1, he says, this is the sum. Here it is. This is the total for all you who like numbers and working on your CPA as John is and other things like that. Here's the sum. Here is the bottom line. Here's what's left in the bank account. This is it. Here it is. This is the total deal. And the total sum then is laid out. And all the chapter we're preaching on today is the total sum of the last couple of chapters about Jesus being the best thing, the best minister, the best priest that can represent you to God. <clears throat> He's the best for many reasons. We're going to see it. What's the word minister mean? It's always funny what, when people, they call pastors different things. I've already, I make pot shots at this one, reverend, reverend, or a minister. Do you know what it means? It's not a title. It's not a, hot, uh, a lofty title, minister. It's a, it's a bottom level title. It's, minister means servant, right? One who serves, and minister specifically, one who serves publicly, a servant, one who ministers to others. Jesus is called the minister, the better minister in here. It's a, it's a word that I'm using that's directly out of chapter 8. He's the better minister. Specifically here, it's Jesus who's ministering man, to mankind to bring us to the Lord. He is doing things in order to bring us closer to the Lord, or specifically a thing. That's what the Old Testament priests were supposed to be doing when they sacrificed the lambs and all that. They were doing these religious things supposedly to bring people to the Lord. What everyone realized then eventually after hundreds and hundreds of years is this is not getting me closer to the Lord. There's a problem with it. It's broken. And it was broken because it never was meant to be the real object to bring you closer to the Lord. It was a foreshadowing of a day that was coming where a real high priest would do a real thing that would bring you not just close to the Lord, will bring you, there's not an English word that can explain the closeness of someone who has trusted on Jesus Christ to the Lord. You are one with the Lord. You are one with Him. He is in you and you're in Him. Chapter 7, verse number 19, we had a phrase that we touched upon. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, that's Jesus Christ, by the which we draw nigh unto God. How many of you want to be near God? You say, what do you mean physically, spiritually, everything? Man, I want to be near God. I do. Somebody made all this. Somebody made this, this, this ball spin. Somebody made the sun so fiery and bright. Somebody made grass grow and somebody... Somebody made things happen, and the, the oceans don't flood us. They stay where they're supposed to be. They come up on the shore, and I like to watch it come up and lap the sand, but it never, unless there's a, uh, a great hurricane comes over, and then it always goes back. Who did these things? Who made my eye to be able to focus better than any digital camera? Who did this? Who did this? What is the creator's name? What company made this? All this stuff. I want to be near the God. I want to know him. And there's one that allows us to know him, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the better minister, and the ministry that he does is draw us near to God. Now, let's look at this. He is a better minister. You may say, better at what? Better than what? If he's better, he's got to be better than something. Well, better than anything that can represent mankind. Better than anything else that can try to draw you near God. Better than religion? Better than Old Testament sacrifices, better than the law, better than anything. Christ is better. And there's two major reasons stated in this passage of why he is better. He is better because he has better gift to give, a better sacrifice. You can use the same word, gift and sacrifice. He's better because he makes a better sacrifice, and he's better because he has a better covenant. Okay, those are the two, the two outlines. You just got it. Number one, he is better because he gives a better gift. He has a better sacrifice to God than anything else. A better Thing that God is willing to receive. Now let's look at that. Look at verse number 1 through 6. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is a sum, we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of God, of the majesty, right, let me slow down, right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister, there's that word, someone who is serving men, 
of the sanctuary. That was the, you know, uh, we call sanctuary a place of worship. You know, there it's any place of a holy place that you're coming near God. And of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Okay, you got two tabernacles going on in verse number two. One of them is man is pitching it, which was the physical one, the Jewish one. And there's another one here, a heavenly one. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on the earth, on earth, he should not be a priest or could not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Look up here. Jesus doesn't have any lambs. He's not toting around goats when he was here for 32 years. He's not looking, offering pigeon. He has no grain that he's throwing up in the air. Okay, he, he never even tried to be a priest, but he is the priest. And I'm going to show you that. Verse 5, who serve unto the example or shadow of heavenly things and shadow. As Moses was also admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see, saith he, God, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. But now hath Jesus, he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is a mediator or a negotiator of a better covenant or contract, which was established upon better promises. Jesus is better to bring us to God or any man to God because he has a better gift. What am I talking about? The way the, the Jews the, or the Jewish priests served was to offer gifts and sacrifices to the people. If you're real poor, I've already told you this, you can't afford a lamb, can't afford a goat, you bring a pigeon. All right? You, uh, in different times, they offered up grain and these kind of things to, to, for the people to God, incense. They burn incense, different things. For thousands of years, that's what Jewish priests did. They were offering, though, an inferior sacrifice that can never bring men to God. I hate to tell you this, but burning incense smells great, and I love Yankee candles, but it will not bring you closer to God. I'm going to give you something else. Coming to Light Lighthouse Baptist Church will be a great experience for you, I hope. I hope that you will enjoy yourself. I hope that you will like the singing. I hope that you will enjoy the piano. I, I hope that you will, uh, you know, like the offering time and like the things that we do and the announcements or whatever, but it won't bring you one inch closer to God. Religion can't do that. My church can't do that. Your church can't do that. The Methodist church can't do that. The Catholic church can't do that. The Baptist church can't do it. Religion can't do it. But there's something or someone that can. Those sacrifices and those religious experiences, all those hundreds of years, the gifts that were offered, never made the perfect coming, the people coming perfect so that they could come into the presence of God or so that everything could be right between them and God. It just didn't happen. Because it was a Polaroid snapshot, it wasn't the real thing. Notice in verse number three, priests offered gifts and sacrifices, and Jesus as priest must have something to offer. Right? He's called the high priest. They all had like goats and livestock and a whole zoo. Okay? They were offering to God all this stuff. You know, blood of this and this and this. Verse 4 says that if you're on the earth, he couldn't be a, a priest because frankly, he didn't have any lambs and goats and pigeons. He didn't even, do you remember when he was here? If you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you don't find him one time trying to be a priest. He doesn't, he's not into lambs and goats and pictures and Polaroid snapshots. He's not into the foreshadowing because he is the real thing. They all spoke of him. They were all just pictures of a sacrifice coming. He never even attempted to do the priestly duties. But I love verse number three. Look at it. It says, it says at the end, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have something also to offer. You know, we call him the best high priest. You know, he's got to have something. What does he have? It's not little sticks that you buy at the Chinese shop that you can, you know, smoke. It's not that. Incense. It's not goats. It's not grain it's not any of these things and you know i was i scoured as i first started reading this passage of what is what is he giving it, it's talking about it, these gifts and he's got to have a gift and you look through the pages too look at look at the first six or seven verses you can't find anything that jesus is giving and i'm thinking it says verse three says he's got to have a, a sacrifice he's got to have a gift to give to god i couldn't find anything then folks it hit me square in the face what we had preached last week Look, please, to chapter 7 and verse number 27 that is right before this chapter. What is Jesus offering? <coughs> Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up, what's the next word? What is the sacrifice that Jesus gives? 
Yell it out loud, folks. Don't you be a bump on a log. It's not the lamb. It's not the goat. It's not the bullock. It's not the incense. All those things were pictures of the day that would come that he would offer up the real deal himself. Verse number three, it's necessary that he has something to offer as the best high priest. What is that? It is 727. Jesus offered himself. He gave himself. He was what he handed to God to make you acceptable to God. He gave the perfect sacrifice. It involves all the blood and all that stuff because, frankly, you say your religion is a bloody religion. Yes, it is. It's of necessity bloody religion because that's what God said would atone when some man would bleed out for you, would give his life for you. It was a necessity. Jesus' gift and sacrifice was himself. The Jewish priest could help you with lambs and goat sacrifices, but this better minister can help you because he offered the perfect sacrifice of his own blood and broken body on Calvary. He offered himself, he handed himself as a, as a sacrifice. I almost said living, but he was dead and then came alive for you. And that's what God required. Every sacrifice before was just a shadow of this true sacrifice. In verse number one, the last part, in verse number two, show us that those earthly priests were just ministering a symbol. Look at verse number two, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. For every priest, high priest, is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, whereof it is a necessity that this man have someone to offer. Now look verse number five, who serve these priests unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. You see, it was all... They were all doing this as a picture of something real. Those priests were just ministering a symbol, a foreshadowing picture of the real thing. The real thing is in heaven where God went after the crucifixion and offered himself as the great work with, that he had done on the cross. You may see the thing that that's a light thing. You may think it's a religious thing. You may think it's a story thing. But let me tell you, it is a very real thing. And in the economy of how God is worshipped, and in the economy of how a man, a piddly man like me, who will live 70 years, I hope, and then die, in that economy, there is one thing that God respects and He regards. It is that sacrifice that happened at Calvary, at the cross, that the perfect one died for you, the imperfect sinner, and that He paid it all. And the, what he offered was not bulls and goats, blood and incense and all that, which were only pictures of the real day. What he offered was really Jesus' body and blood, crushed, broken, bled out, and his life taken away from him in your place. Hell for you. Jesus' hell was that he was separated from his father and that he was killed. The wages of sin is death, and that's what he received. It was God dying on the cross. God the Son equal with God. That is the sacrifice that God regards, not the incense and the blood, which are all pictures. The heavenly mercy seat at the Father's hand is where Jesus went. He went and took himself and offered himself, and there sits perpetually forever at the right hand of the Father for you. Perpetually. I like the word perpetually because we understand what it means. What is a perpetual flame that you put on a gravestone? It is a flame that never goes out, theoretically, that, that never, ever, never, ever is snuffed out. Never. It just always goes. At the, at, uh, we were just at, at the... Uh, soldiers, I can't think of the name. Yell it out, okay? This Arlington. We were just at Arlington, and there's that perpetual flame that never goes out there, okay? That's always burning there, always burning, right? Jesus Christ, when he took himself to the Father's right hand, was the perpetual sacrifice that was offered once for all that never, ever stops, that never needs to be repeated. It always continually sits there at the right hand of the Father for you. It is a perpetual thing. The sacrifice that Jesus ministers for you is not reoccurring, but once for all, that gift of Jesus Christ himself is the sacrifice. It sat right down, verse number one. You've got to get the thinking here. 
Let's go halfway here. Who is set, verse 1, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched not man for every high priest to ordain. Talks about gifts and sacrifices. This man has somewhat to offer, verse 4, for if you're on earth, he could not because he didn't have goats and all that stuff. He, he, he couldn't be a priest because he didn't offer that way. Verse, verse 5, uh, they, were, they served as an example, a, a shadow of heavenly things, and it goes on from there. And the point of, the, of these verses is, from verse number 27 of the last chapter is, yes, Jesus Christ is a minister who gave the ultimate sacrifice. It was him. And look at this. You know how the priests, when they, you know, year by year, the people came. This is also in Hebrews. They came. They offered the sacrifice. They went away. They knew they were going to have to come again, 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 again. The priest, he offered the sacrifice, and it was gone. Listen, you need to understand that Jesus is a perpetual sacrifice. Once for all, he was offered, but the sacrifice never runs out. The sacrifice makes the people who come by Jesus Christ perfect forever. And how do I know that? Because the sacrifice did not stay on earth. It went and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And friends, today is right there for you. Jesus, right now, I know exactly where he is. He's on the right hand of the Father interceding for me. The sacrifice is perpetually burning for me. It was offered one time at, right after Calvary. He rose from the dead and he sat down on the literal mercy seat. And I'm going to talk about it in a minute. He sat down right beside his father and that flame burns. It is perpetual. It's a perpetual sacrifice. We don't get saved over and over and over. The flame still burns. We don't come back to Jesus over and over and over. He's in our hearts. We don't come back to the cross. It was once and for all. And there he sits. My sacrifice still is being offered, but not in the way of over again, perpetually. It is just there. The blood always covers. Jesus always, continually. Not one time when I, when I, when I fall into the utter despair and I fall into the greatest of sin. As a blood-washed child of the living God, it never stops. The flame burns on. It is always covering me. Wow. If there's anything in, in this church that's good stuff, that is good stuff. And that is incredible. And as I read these chapters, I hope that you'll start from verse 27, maybe when you go home of chapter 7, and you realize what it's saying is the sacrifice sat down beside God and perpetually represents us. That is a better sacrifice. That heavenly position at the mercy seat is the real deal. The earthly tabernacle, the holy place, the furniture, the ark of the covenant, the mercy seat, the holy of holies, they're just a Polaroid shot. The representations of the real throne of God. The real mercy seat. And frankly, friends, you need to understand, I'm not talking about spiritually. I'm talking about in reality, a reality that is more real than us. Verse 5 says that those earthly things serve as an example and shadow of heavenly things. Then God gives an example for us to understand. He said, you remember when I told Moses on Mount Sinai, or Sinai, however you pronounce it, Sinai? Remember when I told him on Mount Sinai, do all those things, uh, build that tabernacle, that tabernacle according to the pattern that I showed you up at Mount Sinai. Do you remember when he said that? Okay, this is what it's saying. It's an example. Consider the word pattern. A pattern is not a blueprint. What God is saying here is, you know, I, I showed you a photocopy. I didn't show you a blueprint that I drew down. I showed you a copy of something that is real in heaven. And I want you to make it, that tabernacle, according to the photocopy that I sent you. Verse number five. Notice it says, who serve unto the example of and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. It's a real thing. You ask me if there is a heavenly tabernacle exactly like the earthly one up in heaven. How many of you ever seen in a book or somewhere this, uh, the tabernacle? Maybe you went to uh, Lancaster and saw, uh, you know, them rebuild. How many of you seen the tabernacle? You've seen it maybe in your church, at Sunday school. This means this, this means this, okay? All right? All right. Do you, I believe that there is a heavenly tabernacle. I'll say this to you. The dimensions are different. Perhaps the material is different. But yes, me and J. Vernon McGee believe that there is a tabernacle in heaven. 
and uh, I don't think any, there's any way to get around it. It's not a mystical tabernacle in heaven. It is real. God's throne is there. He is sitting at the mercy seat. And uh, there's a real Holy of Holies, and Jesus is sitting there right beside Jehovah's side. The dimensions of the holy place, they say the dimensions are different, material probably different. The dimensions of the holy place have to be different. They got to be. The old one was 15 feet by 15 feet. But now the veil is rent in two, and every person who have ever, has ever been saved has to fit into the Holy of Holies because we are all welcome there. So it can't be the same size. I am speaking as a fool. I will have a new body, and heaven's cubed anyhow. Some people believe we live on the inside of a cube in heaven. I don't know. That blows my mind. I'm just happy to have a can of cashews and some chocolate milk, you know? <laughs> I do not know, but I know there's a real holy of holies, and I know there's a real mercy seat, and I know that Jesus Christ himself is sitting at the right hand of Father on the throne there. I know that, because the Bible says he is. The point that is most precious, folks, is this. Jesus is right there now for you, presently interceding, perpetually burning, presently in all reality, ministering on your behalf. We sing songs, we go, through, go to services, we go through the routine, but the routine is not the worship. We sing songs, but that is not the ending place. We don't sing, oh, that was a beautiful song. We sing to Jesus. We sing to the Lord. This is all just the organization of true worship. It's not the real worship. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, I feel so much better since I've been to church. What? You ought not feel any better here than in your closet when you're pouring your heart out to the Lord. The the worship is what we do from the heart to the Lord. Jesus is really sitting there. God is really sitting there. And when we sing or when we do whatever, we give to the Lord, we minister for the Lord, we are doing it for a real Jesus. If this church should burn down tomorrow, and I sure hope it, it doesn't, but if it should burn down to, uh, tomorrow, the worship of Lighthouse Baptist Church goes on. Our worship is not in padded seats and in Yamaha pianos. We worship the Lord in reality. Jesus is really on the throne. I can really go into the Holy of Holies when I kneel in prayer every time. If I could see with the right eyes, I'd be standing before God or kneeling before God himself. It is real. Wow. The gift, the sacrifice to God, Jesus himself, still sits interceding for us now and forever. There's a, that was the, that's a gift he gives, but there's a, there's a reason why Jesus is a better minister it's that's different than that too he's a better minister also because of the covenant the contract how many have ever signed a contract you ever signed a contract you bought a house you bought a car whatever you signed a contract with your kid brother that if he did this and this and this you give him your piggy bank you know we've all <coughs> signed contracts we've we've entered into contracts okay that's what the word covenant means it's an agreement by two or more people so when you see this covenant, this agreement here, Jesus is a better minister not only because he gives a better sacrifice, because he is the mediator or the negotiator of a better contract with God. Look at verse number 6. It says, But now uh, hath he obtained a more excellent minister, by how much also he is the mediator or the negotiator of a better contra uh, covenant or contract, which was established among better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place been sought have, have been sought for the second but for finding fault with them he saith behold the days come saith the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the contract with the covenant that I made with the, their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them uh, out of the land of Egypt because they continued not with my covenant and I regarded them not saith the Lord for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws in their mind, and I'll write them in their hearts, and I'll be to them a God, and they shall be my people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know you the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest, not for I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities, who I remember no more. That's the old covenant and the new covenant. Jesus is a better minister because uh, he gives a better sacrifice. And also because he is a negotiator of a better contract with God. You know, there are at least eight major contracts between God and man in your, in, in your Bible, throughout the whole Bible, all right? Some study Bibles you, right now, if you look in your reference, they might list them. Okay, mine does list them. 
Of all of those, there are two that sticks out greatly. One is called the Mosaic Covenant, having to do with the law, Mosaic, Moses, what was agreed after he pulled him out of Egypt and he wrote the law. That's the first one that's big. The second one that is the biggest is the New Covenant. And that's what Jesus did. And this is a comparison between those other covenants. All the other covenants kind of just fall into line somewhere, but those are the, this is the one he's talking about, the old one, the one Moses did, and, and the new one, the one Jesus did. This contract of, with Moses had conditions. If you'll look, please, at the end of uh, verse number uh, 9, you'll see that God disregarded them. Why did he disregard them? Because they broke their conditions. Have you ever signed a contract that had conditions? If you don't pay your car payment, we're going to come and get your car. You pay your house payment. We're going to get it. Uh, my, 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 the best one is this: zero percent interest. Really fine, 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 fine bit for the first two days. After that, twenty-one point eight percent. Okay, conditions, conditions, right? Uh, the Moses uh, covenant contract between God and man. God had some conditions. The conditions sound like this. Romans 8 or 10, 5 quotes the Old Testament. Here's the conditions. For Moses describeth righteousness which is of the law, that man which doeth those things, doeth the law, shall live by them. Did you catch the conditions? Here's the conditions. If you want to be righteous, and you're coming to the law to be righteous, you have got to live the law. There's no percentage on that. It's 100% or nothing. Those who break it are the ones who break one commandment. I would like the man and the woman in this room who's never broke one of God's commandments to stand at this time. It's an impossibility. All right? This first covenant was, had conditions, and it was a strong conditions. You have got to live it all or nothing. That's a pretty bad covenant. It is impossible to keep up your end of it. It's a faulty covenant. Verse 7 in your Bible, look there, 9-7. It's fault. If it was faultless, he wouldn't have had to make another one. It had fault, and, and it was designed to have fault. Look up here. God didn't mess up when he was doing the Moses covenant. He wanted people to see that they could not be perfect themselves. That was, that was a joke. And so for hundreds of years, he brought this frustration covenant until they cried out, there's got to be something different. We're, we cannot do this one. This one's broken. It, it doesn't get us one inch closer to God. These conditions are terrible. Once again, I remind you that God knew this law covenant wasn't mankind's final answer. In fact, it highlighted that man couldn't keep the covenant. They needed a not a conditional covenant. They needed an unconditional one. You know what unconditional covenant is? This is deep, buddy. It's a covenant that doesn't have conditions. I went to school for that. <laughs> An unconditional covenant means that God is going to do it no matter if you hold up your end or not because you don't have an end. Here's a, what uh, an unconditional covenant says, says. It sounds like this. I'm going to write my law in your heart and in your mind. And your sins and your iniquities, I'm going to remember no more. I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And, and you're waiting for the, you know, the, what's, the, what's that saying, the second shoe to fall? I do not know what that means. But you're waiting for your side of it. And guess what? Your side doesn't come. Because it's unconditional. What Jesus did on the cross is unconditional for you. That means there's no your side to do. I'm going to go to the church. And I, I'm going. Whoa, whoa. It's unconditional. In fact, if you try to put your conditions on it, you can't get it because it's unconditional. You have to accept it freely as unconditional. It don't make no sense. I gotta help uh, people. I gotta give to the United Way, and I gotta do this. I got, I got, I got, I got, I got is the problem. Salvation through Jesus Christ has no I got. It's free, and that's the hardest thing for men to accept. So they don't accept it. They'd rather try. They'd rather they'd rather stay someplace where they can do something. They'd rather stay in a religion where they have to work for it. And Jesus, hey, it's an unconditional, I'm going to do this. And Jesus negotiated, please do not think that it wasn't without cost. It's just that you don't pay the cost. It's not without work. It's just you didn't do the work. Jesus, substitution, hello, he did it for you. Okay, it's already done. You can't add it. To add something to it is an offense to God and is not real salvation. I believe Jesus and, you got any ands, you better throw them away right now. Because no man will ever get to heaven that said, I believe Jesus Christ and I did this. I love when I knock on the door sometimes. I, 
do you know the Lord Jesus is your Are you a believer, a true Christian? Oh, yes, I play in the choir. I play for the choir. I've had several that have said I play organ in the church. I love that. As if there was some connection between pushing down the notes on that instrument and the fact that your sins are washed away. <laughs> There's no connection. If you're trusting, friend, in anything other than the sacrifice that was made by Jesus himself, you have come short. Your desire to add something to Jesus has removed Jesus from you. He will only save you one way, unconditionally. He did it all. It's God's way. It had to be God's way because for hundreds of years they learned that you can't do anything. It's just a frustration of trying to live perfectly and do this. Let me ask you a question. If you do 98 billion things that are good for God, will that negate the 500 sins you've committed against Him? There is no connection between being good and having your sin washed away in the whole Bible. Jesus Christ, in verse number 6, is the mediator or negotiator of such an unconditional new covenant, a contract. He wrote it in His blood on the cross and delivered it to the first party of the contract, God Himself, Jehovah God. It's not like the Mosaic Covenant. Verse 9 says that the old covenant was made when God took Israel by the hand and delivered them out of Egypt. Look at verse number 9. Do you see the love there? I took you by the hand. I brought you out of Egypt. I made a first covenant with you. You live perfectly and you'll be righteous. God's love was there, but His conditions were there also, and they broke it. In the, the end of verse number 8 says, I disregard you. I regarded them not. They broke their contract. There would be no righteousness. They couldn't keep up their end of the deal. The second part of the contract did not continue in keeping the law. God says they broke it. They didn't keep up their conditions, and He disregarded them. The contract is broken. But there is a new covenant, folks, of which Jesus ministers. He is the negotiator. He is the minister, the mediator in this passage. It's unconditional. It's found in verse number 10. Listen, please. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to my people. Scan over the next part, those next verses. If you find any conditions on that, there is none. Because Jesus will save you without any help of your own. You say, I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to believe that. We're well, not willing to be saved then. You're not willing to be rescued from all the penalty of your sin. You say, yeah, that's what you believe. This is what God, the ever-living God, said right here in the Bible. You can read it with your own eyeballs, and I hope that you will. This is the very word of God. Thus saith the Lord, I will give you this new covenant. It is unconditional and it is free. You don't have to keep up some end of it. God says writing the rules and the laws in stone and paper does not work. The people mess up. They can't keep an agreement. I'll make a new contract with them that is in the depths of their gizzards. And yes, that's on my paper. It's a brand new covenant. It's inside them. It's not written somewhere. And no one like a slave master whips a whip and says, do this, do this, do this, do this, because they do it from within because I am inside them. I am inside them and they want to do right. It's an internal salvation, not an external keeping of the law. It's inside the believer. It is a new covenant that is not something, a bunch of rules to keep. It is Christ in us, the hope of glory inside us that we want to do right because no one tells us it is God Himself within us. Wow. Instead of whipping them into keeping my laws in stone, God says, I'll change their heart and I'll make them have desire within them to do righteousness inside them. The perfect Word of God will resonate inside their own hearts as good and desirable and pleasant to do. Verse number 10 and 11 are a quote from Jeremiah about a day coming, the day that we have found when God is, is willing to come inside of you and save you from the inside out. And that it's not an external list of laws to keep. 
It is, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are come new. God planned that new covenant, that it would not be dependent on man's will to perform, but rather his choice to be their God, and they shall be my people. And I'm not speaking of individual Calvinistic election, but rather the nature of our salvation being without any work of our own it is a contract that doesn't have a second party condition. Let me put it in real terms. I have to use BMW in this church. You got a contract. <clears throat> in the British Motor W. Thank you. Says, uh, we're going to give you a brand new BMW. A bunch of number with an I at the end. You say, yeah, what do I do for it? Pick up the keys. What, what, I, what, are the, what, are the, what are the payments? Is this a lease program? Hmm? No, you just got to come get it. You just, just take it, just receive it. Just got to get it. Just, we just want to give it to you. In fact, we'll come where you are. We'll, we'll bring it to you. Really? Well, what I have to do, I see there's, is there some pages missing? Because I really don't see my side. Of, it's, just, it's just really no side. You just have to receive it. I don't think so. If I don't have to do something for it, my dad told me, you know, hard work is what, sorry, I don't want it. No, sir, you don't understand, it's free. Now, I don't want it. It's free. We're paying for it. You know, we, we took care of it. We, you know, it cost us something, but we took care of it. And to, for you, this Beamer is free. You, you just need to receive, all you got to do is take it. That's too, or there must be a catch. Are you, are you going to steal my identity or something? Well, what's, what's the catch here? Okay. Listen, that may be a silly thing, but we can understand that. And that's what the new covenant is. And that's what Jesus offers. And that's his negotiation. This is what he brings. And friends, that covenant that came by Jesus' cross forever carries for every man an unconditional salvation. God justifies. God changes him with them. God promises and guarantees the eternal security. Jesus sits perpetually ministering at the right hand of God for the recipients of this new covenant. And we are covered by the blood for every sin and beyond that within every true believer is the Holy Spirit of God that makes us new, that cries out, He is our God and we are His people. And His laws are in our hearts. We desire to do right. We desire not to sin because it's God's law that's not written somewhere, but it's the Word of God that resonates within our hearts that this is right and this is from my gizzard. I know I want to do this. And that is not how you're born. That comes by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ in a moment a change occurs within you. You don't levitate, but He comes to live inside of you. The Holy Spirit, forever and ever and ever. Jesus, the mediator at the right hand of God, becomes your mediator because you believe what He did on the cross and that He rose again. And He is the substitutional way, the only way to draw near to God. Verse 11 says that in this wonderful day of Jesus' salvation, the new covenant, there will be not a need for Christians to tell their brothers all the time to seek the Lord and to know the Lord, because every believer, young and old, rich and poor, will have God living within them. I don't need anybody to tell me to pray. I don't need anybody to tell me that I should read my Bible. I want to. And listen to me, friends. That is something within every believer, a desire to do right. I don't have to have somebody telling me that sin is sin. Because the Word of God and what the preacher says resonates within me because there's a Holy Spirit of God that says, that's right, from my inside out. Do you understand what I'm saying? What a wonderful thing we have. What an incredible thing. What an incredible covenant that is within us. They, they'll seek the Lord in spirit. It's a spiritual thing, an inside thing, not simply a physical religion. And that is now. And when I look you in the eyes, we close this sermon and ask you, is it in you? Have you received this covenant, this contract? Let me say that another way. Have you put your only hope of being forgiven for your life's sin on what happened 2,000 years ago on that cross outside of Jerusalem? That God came down to earth, was born of a virgin, lived 32, 33 years, whatever. He died on the cross as a mission to take hell for mankind. And you really believe that all your sin was laid upon him and that he was whipped and killed and slaughtered for them. He had no sin of his own, but he took yours. 
And then he rose again three days later, and he went up and he sat down beside the right hand of the Father forever to represent as perfect those that would believe on what he did. Now I'm asking you, is that what is in your heart? And he says that when you believe on him, Jesus Christ, that he will put his laws and his, the things that he loves, truth, not lying, purity, not adultery, not fornication, he'll put all of those things inside of you, that you will want to do them. It's not that you don't struggle. In fact, that struggle for a Christian is representative that there is something there that is struggling against your sin. It's a wonderful thing to struggle as a Christian against temptation because you know the Spirit of God is yelling inside of you because the new covenant is inside of you and He's put your laws, His laws in your heart, brother. It's inside of you. It's a great thing. It's a thing to shout glory about. But as I look at the congregation here and those that are in the modular, I ask you, is that, has that happened to you? Has that happened to you because you've put your faith and trust in what happened 2,000 years ago by the Son of God dying on the cross for you? It is the paramount decision of your life and of the universe for that matter. It's really when everything else burns away, it's the only thing that really matters. That you are near God. And that He's not going to, in His true anger and holiness, hold your sin against you when you die. Because perpetually someone already got whipped in your place and he sits at the right hand of God for you. And there are some benefits, as you will notice in your Bible, as you look down at the end verses, there are some benefits or promises that come from them, from this. It says, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. The Word of God in several places, for instance, Psalm 103. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgressions from you. Those who have their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. How, how far is east from west? <laughs> it's a forever away. And that's how far he removes our sin. There's another passage of scripture I love so well. that It says that their sins and their iniquities will I not impute to them. Blessed is the man whose iniquities are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That means he'll never put it on their account. You're like Teflon. Ronald Reagan was called the Teflon president because all these bad things happened during his administration, but none of it stuck to him. Okay? And you know what? That's, that's how someone who is saved is with God. Someone who is, who is covered by the blood of Christ, they are they will not, it's not like that they, they haven't sinned or won't sin until the day they die, actually. It's just that because we've accepted Jesus Christ, we're Teflon, God will not impute to us sin. He, just, he doesn't charge it to our account because it was already charged to Jesus on the cross. As I say this to you, I can't help but think that the Lord, as we end this message, would ask you, from sitting, Jesus Christ, from sitting right beside God the Father, tell them, I don't hear any voices or anything, this is pure speculation, but tell them I'll do it for them. Pastors, deacons, teens, seniors, visitors, if you're here individually and this has not happened in your life, there is a starting point when you receive Jesus Christ. It is not a process. It is a time where you say, Jesus Christ, I am full of sin. I believe that you're the way of forgiveness. I want you, Jesus. Please save me. Those aren't exact words. Those are from the heart. You're admitting your sin. You're believing that Jesus is the only way, and you're asking him to save you. You're just receiving him like that beamer. You're just taking him. Back in 1980, on a July summer day, I put my faith in Jesus Christ, and it's all the different on the inside of me. It's real. Now, are, is that what's on the inside of you? Have you received Jesus Christ? Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes?